Thanks for joining me in the Storycraft Cafe. I'm Hank Garner, your host, and with me today, I'm super excited to have James Rollins. Uh, we are here to talk about his brand new book that's just releasing. It's called Kingdom of Bones, and uh, I've had a chance to read uh, the advanced reader copy of this. And uh, you know, in typical James <laughs> fashion, it, uh, it 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 ramped up and didn't let go of me un- until the very end, James. Um, so, you know, I I don't know what more to say other than it's a it's a James Rollins book, one hundred percent. Hey, we're in a pandemic, you know. I've, I've got to at least, you know, you know, for me alone, it's, it's just, I have to have this armchair adventure. <laughs> it's, right. We're all stuck in our in our homes for the last two years. It's uh, when I was writing this story, it was much a uh, you know I was having as much fun writing it as hopefully people are going to do uh, reading it. Yeah, um, we talked uh, last a, a a year or so ago, and did this book have a different title at the time? It did. Um, it was going to be called The Savage Zone, but That's you know, it's, right. again, authors have no say over what, what their titles are. <laughs> They're like, no, we liked it initially, but now that we're thinking about it, no, let's, you know, give me some other options. So, you know, I just gave them, you know, 15 different options. They passed the sales and marketing department and Kingdom of Bones was uh, <laughs> was the one they decided they like more. So well, that's one thing about uh uh, publishing is we have very little control over titles and and, and cover. You know, pretty much yeah. it's like, do you like this cover? Yes, that's the only the only response they want from you. <laughs> um, well, speaking of pandemics, this this book has a um, deals with uh, w- with that subject matter in a way. Um, it, were you um, th- was there any trepidation around you know kind of tackling this subject matter or was this something that you had already been researching and i know there's a lot of kind of pre-research that goes into your books but kind of how did how did that storyline come about well it came about because of an article i read a new scientist back in uh beginning of 2019 okay it was asking you know when can we expect the next global pandemic and I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, so I'm reading the article about these virus hunters and people searching these uh, exotic corners of the world, you know, getting samples from bats and other exotic species, looking for the uh, pathogen that might be, uh, you know, disease X, the the pathogen that all that terrifies all virologists. It's the pathogen that is highly contagious and has no cure. So I thought, well, that's interesting. But it, you know, I was worried because I'd already done pandemic novels in the past. There was uh, The Seventh Plague was a pandemic novel. Right. Um, so I didn't really want to do a, another pandemic novel, but I was the more I was you know, sort of following this thread, I, I, I found more about the weird biology of viruses, the the strange way they're connected to uh, our own evolutionary history. And I became sort of intrigued about doing a, a viral novel, sort of shining a light on the weirdness of viruses in general. So, I, you know, come at the end of 2019, I, you know, I pitched this uh, story idea to my editor and she said, yes, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool, you know. Let's, let's go, you know, go run with that. So I began, you know, working on the story, and I was in. Uh, so the last Odyssey came out uh, just as the pandemic was starting, and I had about halfway through Kingdom of Bones at that point. And my editor then, of course, called me back and said, "Did any of the virologists you were speaking to did they did they warn you about what was going to happen? Did you was there any inklings that there was a, that this was going to occur? Yes, so, you know how." How weird it is that you're writing a, a virus novel just as a pandemic's beginning. Right. And and at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, it's it's sort of you know a bit of serendipity that this is happening. Not not not, not a good serendipity. Right. Uh, but at the same time, I'm thinking, who's going to want to read a book about viruses in the middle of a pandemic? You're probably going to be sick and tired of it. So there was a lot of you know, should I really write this? You know, is it is it. Uh, not insulting, but is it uh, is it does it is it rude to sort of uh, tackle this novel when when people are suffering from a viral pandemic? Right. Is it you know is it best you know, can I write a popcorn adventure novel with big roller coaster about a virus when people are dying? Uh, you know, so so I was on the fence about throwing the entire idea away, um, but I kept working on it, and because uh, again we're halfway done, it's hard to stop a novel. So your trains, you know, your train tracks are laid. You know, well, I'm just going to, you know, finish writing it, which was a challenge in and of itself because uh, I had to keep tweaking this novel as I was writing it because, you know, the 
the zeitgeist of, of, of uh, the, the average reader's knowledge of viruses has expanded over this past year. So 100%. You know, things I'm, you know, I had to, I had to, to make sure that you know, all my details were accurate to make sure that what I was saying uh, did not seem out of sorts with what was happening with the current pandemic. So there's a lot of tweaking that was involved in writing the novel during this pandemic. So um, a popcorn adventure is exactly how I described this book to a friend of mine just this morning. We were talking about it, and I said this would make an epic summer tentpole popcorn adventure movie. This would be because you, you know, you it, at the beginning you you push us off that cart that of the roller coaster, and and you know we're in. It, it's just immediately. Um, did the reality of a global pandemic and how that all unfolded, did that sort of ratchet up um, the level of um, adventure and tension that the book came about? Did, because it 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 feels like it was written very close to the bone, very raw. Um, I, I, I'm, you know. You know, we we can interpret and and project our own stuff onto books that we're reading, but to me, it it very much had that uh, sense of immediacy um, to it. Do do you feel like that affected the writing at all? I think it did because you know I I love doing research and yeah. uh, you know probably too much, and I probably make my readers read too much of my research at times. Uh, like, but. Uh, you know, when you're in the midst of a viral pandemic and now you're thinking about, you know, how am I going to protect my own life or the or right. life of my family members? Uh, now it becomes not just a matter of what's cool to put in a novel. It's like, what do I need to know that's going to potentially save my life and save other people's lives? And I was also curious, you know, was this virus, you know, produced in the lab? Was it engineered? You know, I'm trying to do research to, to follow through that. You know, is it possible? What's going on? You know, why are bats such a a vector for for disease, uh, for viral diseases? Why are everybody seems to focus in on bats? Uh, so a lot of these questions that were raising in my own mind during the pandemic, uh, I would research uh, just because I was curious to get the answer. And I found out that weirdly they were dovetailing into the adventure I wanted to tell. So it was a uh, it was a, a combination of both my self-interest, self-preservation, and uh, finding more intriguing details to sprinkle throughout the novel. So this is the 16th Sigma Force novel, is that right? It is. Uh, again, it's always hard for me to, to exactly tally the number because Sandstorm, I sort of describe it as the prequel to the novel, right. even though it is count, counted as number one because Sigma Force is more sort of a, the support team for the main cast of characters. Right. But uh, that is where Sigma is first introduced, and so we do count that as book number one. So this would then be book number 16. So this is a cast of characters that you are uh, intimate with. I mean, you know these people, you know, back to front. And, and uh, you know, there's a certain freedom that comes with writing uh, a long-running series. The, the world building, uh, if you will, is, is kind of in place already. We, we understand the world that the story is going to take place in. We understand the role of the characters and we understand some of their personal lives that have kind of unfolded throughout the books. Um, what are some of the challenges that come with, we, we know what all the benefits are of running, of writing a long running series, but what are some sure. of the challenges of keeping this group together? Uh, and, and there've been some people that have, you know, come and gone, but, um, what are some of the, the challenges of, of keeping this ball rolling and, you know, maintaining relationships and, you know, their place in the world and all of that stuff? Well, initially, I was not planning on doing the series. As I mentioned before, Sandstorm might be the first book in the series because that's when I introduced Sigma. Right. Uh, so I was getting a lot of pressure from my publishing house. You know, Jim, do a series, do a series. Uh, all my early stories were standalone adventures, you know, from subterranean to excavation, deep fathom to Amazonia. They're all, uh, you know, separate cast of characters. They're standalone adventures. And I resisted doing a series because I had an issue with ser doing a series. And it's what I call, I maybe I mentioned this before to you, Hank, I can't remember. It's what I call the Jessica Fletcher syndrome from yes. uh, murder she wrote you know here's this old right. woman from cabot cove that's always falling over dead bodies you know i've never stumbled over dead bodies so you begin to wonder you know what's her problem you know right. why is she always stumbling over dead bodies so your suspension of disbelief becomes strained why is this one character always getting into this problem these problems right. yeah 
by the way, I think the, the final resolution, the only thing that would make sense for the murder she wrote would be the uh, the finale, which reveals that Jessica Fletcher is a serial killer <laughs> and that she's been, you know, framing everybody all along. Yeah. Then, you know, then my suspensions of disbelief would dissipate because then I then it would, oh, aha, of course, that's why it's happening. Right. But the second problem with it with a serious character is that it's hard to maintain jeopardy. Yeah. Is that, you know, somebody might put a gun against Jessica Fletcher's head in, in an episode, but you know that trigger's never going to be pulled as much as you might like it to be pulled because she's in next week's episode. So it's hard to maintain that level of, of threat and that get that heart beating of that that viewer. So um you know, I just did, didn't feel enthused about doing a series until I wrote Sandstorm. And here is this team of Sigma Force, these ex-Special Forces soldiers, you know, retrained in scientific disciplines to protect the world against various threats. And I thought, you know, I could build a series around a team uh, versus necessarily one character. Uh, so, you know, Sigma novels are, are I consider them to be sort of ensemble casts. Yes, there's sort of a, yeah. you know, Gray's the main character for the most part, but, you know, I bring in new characters, uh, other characters sort of bow out for a section. The sh spotlight might shift to another character even more so right. than Gray sometimes. Um, because that, that allows the threat to come from many different directions. I can maintain Jeopardy because uh, Sigma, no Sigma Force member is necessarily safe, uh, as you've if you followed the series, oh yeah, you know, there have been surprising deaths and surprising maimings. Uh, I'm very cruel to my characters because <laughs> Sigma Force can always recruit a new member. Right. So uh, uh, that got please me don't that mess with Gray. Time. Please don't mess with Gray. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, the more you tell me that, the more I. <laughs> of course, of course. Do Do you have a uh, you know a spreadsheet or a poster on the wall of something that you know this? This person is safe. This person, eh, you never know. Like, how do you decide, you know, who you're going to maim or, or kill off? Is there any rhyme or reason or, you know, or you just wake up unhappy with someone? <laughs> it's when someone tells me they really like a character, then it's you know, time to knock them off. No, I'm just joking. Hate gray. It's uh, hate great. <laughs> <laughs> so the basically that's one of the advantages of a series is that you get uh, to ex explore these characters' lives over the span of, of many books. You know, yeah. in Map of Bones, the the second book in the series, the book that sort of introduces Gray and in his and the team that you follow through through the bulk of the rest of the series. And I should make it clear, by the way, is you know I tailor each book that if you've never read any of the previous books, you can jump right into Kingdom of Bones uh, and and read it without having necessarily read everything else. not too many people have read my books in order uh so yeah. if you feel like hopping in a kingdom of bones just just hop right in um but again over the breadth of the series uh you can do things with the characters that you can't do within the, the span of a novel you know map of bones you know say uh you know shoots gray but by book 16 they're married and they have a kid right. it's hard to carry that arc from there to there over one book without without it being you know being farc farcical, so uh, you know. But over the course of sixteen books, I can I can you know I can manage to to, to massage that relationship. Do I know everything that's going to happen with these characters? Nope. Uh, do I know some of the bigger arcs? Yep. Um, you know, a lot of the nuances I, I like to discover along the way. Um, at one point, there was sort of a, a love triangle between uh, Gray, Seishan, and Rachel. Um, and I didn't, to be honest, with you, I didn't know who he was going to end up with. Um, and I was so unsure that at the end of one of my books, uh, you know, he's in bed with somebody, but I don't tell you who he's in bed with. Um, you just know it's, you know, it's one of the two. Right. And so at the end, I just on social media, I just got online and said, you know, you know, who do you think is in bed with Gray and who do you want to be in bed with Gray? And I, I took that, I took those comments to heart, I was, you know, listening to their feedback and why, and and, and that helped me uh, massage which which direction I was going to have that fall. So some of it is, you know, on the fly. Other thing, there's some big arcs that I do know how those characters are going to land. I love it. Um, one thing we know we're going to get from uh, a Sigma Force novel is you're going to find some weird, obscure historical fact. <laughs> uh, and then you're going to find an equally weird uh, scientific fact or some new discovery uh, or some theoretical thing that that shows some hope of becoming a reality. And you find a way to merge those things together in, you know, with mind blowing consequences. Um, what what were those uh, initial uh, discoveries or things that interested you that that then brought you to 
weave those things together to make the story. Well, again, yeah, because again, I, you know, besides being, you know, my my main career, uh, you know, well, I guess I'm still a practicing veterinarian. I still do some volunteer work, but prior to that, you know, on my list of things I want to be when I grow up, underneath veterinarian was I uh, was archaeologist. So I have a tendency to read a lot of you know these books about explorers, and so I was reading a book about uh, the uh, exploration of the Congo. Yeah. And I was just really fascinated by the history and the and the brutality that occurred through there during the Belgian occupation of that area under King Leopold II. Um, and, you know, novels have been written. There's, you know, Heart of Darkness by Conrad, you know, sort of a de- dealt with that type of uh, the brutality that was occurring during that period of time. But in, in doing further research about that whole period of time, I, I just stumbled up, upon this uh, this gentleman, uh, Reverend William Shepard. He was a uh, black missionary uh, out of Alabama who went to uh, the Congo to start a missionary. And he was a basic armed with only with like a, a box camera. And he was the one that more so than than Conrad or the newspapers, he was the one that sort of uh, you know, with, you know, there's nothing like you know, pictures with a thousand words. And he took he took photographs. So he had a, a visual record of what was occurring. Um, and that sort of is what uh was the turning to the moment that turned the tide against uh, uh, Leopold's reign in that area. So I like the fact that there was just this missionary armed with a box camera that you know changed the tide of that country. Uh, so you know I thought that's to be a you know a fun story to tell. And and then again, being the you know the author who's always looking for those historical mysteries. You know, I found out about another historical figure. Again, another another sort of black historical figure, uh, Prester John. He was uh, considered to be the uh, the first black Christian king of a great empire. Um, at this point, you know, he's considered to be mythological. Uh, he's the, the the legend is that he's descended from Balthazar, one of the three magi who visited visited Christ in the right. manger. And for you know centuries, everybody believed he was a historical figure. Emissaries went into the jungle to look for him. The Pope sent uh, his own personal physician to go uh, try to make uh, to make contact with this king. And you know many of them vanished into the jungle and never seen again. Uh, others, the Portuguese people, reported that they found this king in this vast empire. Um, other people did not find this king and dismissed this as rumor. And so over time, it was just considered to be uh, a fanciful story. It wasn't based on reality. But I'm always believing that, you know, any story has a kernel of truth. You know, right. any legend is usually based on something. So yeah. that began, you know, wondering, you know, what if Prester John did exist? You know, what what might have happened to his kingdom? Why did it vanish? Uh, and so that began the, the historical thread of the novel. Is mixing this uh, the history of the Congo from uh, you know, Prester John during the the eleventh, you twelfth, know, thirteenth century to the nineteenth uh, century Reverend who's exposing the atrocities occurring in the Congo uh, that became the uh, the historical jumping off point for the story. I I saw you say I forget where I saw it. It was a a video somewhere where you talked about the reality that every for every square yard there are something like 800,000 or uh viruses that literally fall from the sky um when when you started and I'm I'm sure I butchered that uh, that fact um but when you started exploring that um you know there there comes a point where you're doing research and you're and you're just adding facts and facts and facts um there comes a point where those facts then become threaded into a narrative and and you figure out how sigma force can come in and and then who some of the other players are going to be and and then how do these these colliding facts intervene into these people's lives how did the the story begin to unfold well again it was again looking into not so much building a pandemic novel though you know i'm always looking for the threat that's going to sort of uh, overhang uh, the character the global threat and there's the personal threats uh, so, you know, I knew there was going to be this, this viral outbreak in Africa that was going to be, you know, turning humans into this dull, cat, you know, cat, cattle-like catatonic state. At the same time, it's, it's turning us dull. It's ramping up the environment into this very hostile, very predatory, very uh, toxic uh, uh, danger. So it's, you know, it's a perfect storm for, you know, wiping us out. And uh, so when I was reading about the, the, the viruses, I said that I really wanted to deal with the weird biology of viruses and how they they tie into our own evolutionary history. 
is I you know, found this fact that you know, they believe that anywhere between 40 to 80 percent of the human DNA uh, probably originated from viral invasions. You know, little pieces of virus became incorporated into to DNA during evolutionary development. Eventually, uh, that led to uh, the arrival of consciousness. Even the uh, the our human consciousness is believed to be acquired from a viral invasion. There's a gene that all of us possess called the ARC gene. It's a gene that uh, basically controls the function of our synapses. Uh, it's, it regulates uh, our ability to think. And without that gene present, we would not uh, be the thinking beings that we are. And it has been now known that that, is, that virus, the, that little code of, vi of, of our DNA came from a virus. So, uh, you know, now vi virologists are believing what's called a virus world theory. They believe that, you know, viruses may have been uh, much more important in, in, in evolutionary development than possibly the, even the, uh, the source of life itself. And that uh, viruses are very much in folds into our evolutionary development. So me being the thriller writer, I'm thinking, well, you know, what if Mother Nature gets a little bit uh, tired of us and decides that uh, evolutionary, it's time to make some changes. Um, and if she's going to use a, a key to unlock that uh, that change, she's going to use a virus. So that became the thrust for building the story. When you have a cast of characters like Sigma Force, um, and, and uh, how do you decide which character is going to kind of take center stage? You, you talked about how the the um, the spotlight shines on different characters from time to time. Um, how do you decide who's next up on stage and, and who gets to kind of carry the story for lack of a, a better term it's uh it's mostly i don't sort of pre-decide who's going to be the main character it's more about what the story uh, what serves the story is uh you know i'll build my story the history that the uh, the science and merge them together build my roller coaster adventure then decide you know, who's the character that's best going to tell the story going forward um take bone labyrinth um, and that mm -hmm. story, uh, it deals with, uh, again, a little bit of human development, uh, the origin of human, the human species. It deals with Neanderthals. So I thought, you know, the best person to tell a story about Neanderthals would be Kowalski. And it's sort of the, uh, the, the dumb lug of the, uh, of the, uh, of the group. Uh, so, you know, the necessity then was, okay, I'm going to write a story about Neanderthals. It's going to feature Kowalski is a point of view character for the very first time. Gotcha. Um, Jim, an interesting thing happens when you become a popular author. Um, as before that happens, as readers, most of us have a varied interest. Uh, I I can only um, think of a handful of people that only read one genre and that's that's their thing um i love thrillers i love science fiction i love fantasy um and and i kind of rotate what what i'm reading at the time you know a, a lot depending on what books are coming out or but sometimes i just sure. want to fall into a series and just get lost in another world or something like that um but as writers when when you become a popular thriller author um you know the the propensity is that everyone around you wants you to continue doing that thing that is popular and that is making not only you but everyone else you know um uh, have a successful life um but knowing you and you and I have talked about this uh, a little bit before um I know that you're also a big fan of fantasy and yep. you would think that uh someone that writes you know scientific military thrillers uh, and then someone that wants to write epic fantasy, uh, eh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, why? Why is that? So, um, yes, I, but, I've got that question asked a lot. But the Starless Crown dropped uh, a couple of months ago and it yep. is epic and I love it. And it how do I say this? It feels like a James Rollins novel, um, yet it has all of the epic fantasy stuff that i love um one what what uh what motivated you to to switch genres like that and and the the bigger question that i would love to know is how did your team around you respond to the desire to want to shift gears and do something you know completely different well it I should basically say that you know it's basically 
even though it seems an odd detour for James Rollins to be writing a fantasy novel, it's, it's for me as a writer, it's not. Uh, I yeah. began my career uh, writing a fantasy a year and a thriller a year. The fantasy was under a different pen name because I weirdly went from an unpublished author to suddenly there was two different publishing houses that wanted two books that I'd written that were you know, initially rejected soundly, but eventually they found a home. Within one week, I went from unpublished to two different genres, two different publishing houses, two different pen names. Life got very confusing for a while. Uh, so uh, for the first decade of my career, I was, I was writing, uh, you know, a fantasy novel a year and a thriller a year. Um, and eventually, uh, James Rollins became a little more popular than James Clemens. Uh, there's a little more demand for more James Rollins titles. Um, but I still, uh, for the rest of my career, I was always writing two books a year. I was always doing, uh, you know, the staccato paced thriller, whether it was Sigma or one of my standalones, and then something else. Um, you know, I, similar to you, I read a wide gamut of different genres growing sure. up. You know, if you look at my shelf over here, I've got fantasy, whole section of fantasy, whole section of science fiction, thrillers, military books, um, adventure novels, the old pulp novels from the 30s and 40s, um, and when I was first starting to be, you know, trying to learn the ropes of how to write, you know, I heard you should write what you love to read, which makes sense. You know, some writers will try to pursue what's popular. Yeah. Um, they'll, they'll try to jump on that bandwagon and that's usually not successful. You know, to be able to write in a genre, you need to, you know, have read deeply in that genre. You need to know what, what's stale, what's old, you know, what's going to feel fresh, what's not right. um, to really pull, to pull it off. And so, when I wrote uh, Subterranean, my first thriller novel, and you know, it had telepathic marsupial creatures that live underneath Antarctica. So I thought I was writing science fiction. Yeah. Uh, my publisher informed me that, no, Jim, because you set your story in modern times, not in the future, clearly it's not science fiction. You've, ri you've written a thriller. I wasn't going to argue at this point because, like I said, that novel was rejected soundly. So if someone was showing any inkling of interest, I was not going to argue with them. So I said, yes, it's a thriller. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, uh, that novel was resounded so uh, was rejected so resounded so so you know, forty nine different rejections. I'll admit that it was the fiftieth agent that saw something with that first novel. Wow. Um, so I, I began to thought, well, maybe I'm not that science fiction slash thriller writer. So I jumped to another genre that I love to read fantasy. I began writing a fantasy novel, um, and eventually, like I said, both sold. Um, but over the years. Uh, I've confused my publishing house a little bit. Um, even these Sigma novels, um, they've got a fantastical element to them. They've got weird science that borders on science fiction. They've got, uh, you know, this big uh, uh, military adventure you know, woven into it. And they have a bunch of historical mysteries in it because that's everything that I love to read. So, you know, my publisher at one point, they at this point, Harper had, I don't know, maybe uh, published eight or nine of my novels. And I, I was invited to Harper's uh, offices for the first time in New York City, never been there before. And so it's oh, a bit wow. intimidated. And you know, you're, you're you're put up on the top office floor and this big board room with this long, you know, board table in there and the whole marketing department's there and the sales department and your editor and, and uh, the head of William Morrow at that point, you know, stands up the other side of this long table and looks at me and goes, Jim, you know, we're having good success with your novels, um, but we have one problem. And so, well, what's the problem? We don't know what you're writing. <laughs> so I baffled them from the beginning <laughs> because I do have a tendency to blend genres, even in the Sigma novels. Yeah. So uh, and then as time went on, I would do those other novels of the year. The second novel of the year would be, you know, maybe I'm going to do a novel with a with a veterinarian. So I wrote Ultra of Eden. Uh, you know, I had this idea for, you know, Vampires in the Vatican that became uh, the co-authored work with Rebecca Cantrell, the Blood Gospel series. So I have a tendency to wander off the path a little bit. But ultimately, as, as, as you might have noticed with Starless Crown, there is a, a fundamental commonality with my books. You know, you're yeah. going to find a big adventure. There's going to be a lot of weird animals in my books. Uh, it's going to be, you know, a high paced, you know, high, high, you know, paced staccato yeah. type of pacing to the novel uh at the same time i'm going to you know honor the tropes of that genre you know sure. for starless crown you're going to see it's going to feel like an epic fantasy uh it's, it's going to read like an epic fantasy but hopefully those rollins readers that, that dare wander off the path to follow me there will will find something that uh they're going to recognize they're going to recognize it as a, as a rollins novel 
Well, one thing that I love is that your Sigma uh, books do blend genres, and and I, I love that you kind of pull in everything and all of your varied interests. I know that makes it difficult to know where to place the book in a bookstore sometimes. And and I understand why publishing, you know, likes to have clear genre delineations. I I understand that you need to be able to sell the book and people need to know where to find it. Um, But I love that you mix things up and, um, you know, I never know exactly what to expect. And that's, that's kind of one of the joys of reading one of your novels is that you don't know what to expect. You can take us literally anywhere. And I love that. Um, But there are, like you said, there's a staccato pace to the thrillers, and then fantasy has a tendency to kind of breathe a little, to yeah. slow the pace down, and really pay attention to the world building. And you know, uh, I, I can name a number of fantasy books that may take four, five, six pages to just describe the 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 fauna, you know, around that you see. Um, you know, so there's there's a different a definite pace difference there when you're switching gears from a Sigma novel and then writing a fantasy novel, are there any things that you use to change your mindset to, to uh, embrace the, the difference in the writing style, which will then, you know, the reading style will follow. And do do you pay attention to those things? Does does that make a difference in your preparation to write or, or how you go about the writing of that novel? Oh, oh, definitely. I mean, there. That's one of the things I why I liked running a fantasy novel a year and a thriller a year, is you are you are working a different a different set of gears. Yeah. Um. You know, it's uh when you're writing the staccato pace thriller, uh, there's a certain way uh, I tackle that novel. There's a different way I write that novel. When I switch over to the fantasy, it's a totally different mindset. Um, it is a lot of world building. It is slowing the pace down. It is you're you're allowed the luxury of a little bit more uh, description than you necessarily can in a get, can, can pull away with a uh, with that modern day thriller. So it's a different pace, and I enjoy that. And I think one of the reasons I like switching between those two genres and those two different paces is that I think if I wrote a staccato pace thriller after staccato pace thriller after staccato pace thriller, uh, I might feel like I'm getting bored with it. You know, to me, I like switching gears. It makes me, it feels fresh to me. It feels yeah. new. You know, uh, you know, each genre has their own, you know, things that I enjoy writing and things I don't. Uh, you know, when I'm writing, a, you know, a, a thriller, I'm notorious for, you know, painting my characters into a corner and not really knowing how to get them out of that corner. And at that yeah. point, I'm thinking, you know, I, I need that magic wand to write about now to get these characters out of that corner. Whereas I'm wearing the fantasy, I'm thinking, and I've got these this cast of characters spread across this continent, and I realized, uh oh, that group needs to know this information. Somebody needs to quickly invent the telephone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so there's you know certain 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 things that things things like oh the when I'm you know people that what do you what's what's easier to write fantasy or the thriller? My answer is whatever I'm not writing now, it's always easier. Uh, it's when you're writing the, certain the thriller that seems really hard. When you're writing the fantasy that seems really hard, and so it's a it's fun switching the gears. I tried one point. It was when I was writing Sandstorm, uh, again the first book of the in the uh, Sigma series, and one of my fantasies. And uh, I tried writing on them simultaneously. Uh, you know, doing a chapter of one, then a chapter of the other. Uh, it took me probably twice as long to finish those novels than if I had just done them separately, because just switching from you know having to get my mind out of that type of mindset and, and right. into the other mindset. Uh, it was like stripping those gears in my head at that point. Um, so I, I don't, I can't do that anymore. I know I have to finish the thriller and then do my fantasy, then do the thriller. I've got to stay in my lane. Yeah. Um, Jim, writers uh, have a tendency to spend a lot of time alone. Uh, you know, the the act of writing is a very solitary pursuit. Um, it's a lot of times just you and the keyboard or, you know, the, the notebook, whatever your medium is. And, um, you know, and then later in the process, other people come in and, you know, there becomes a a bit of collaboration between you and an editor and then publisher. And, you know, but, but for the vast majority of that book's life, 
uh, it's just you and and the keyboard. Uh, we have sure. recently launched a community, uh, the Storycraft Cafe, where writers can come in and commiserate with other writers, can share their work and, you know, get feedback and 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 that sort of thing, or just to encourage one another when you're having a bad day. Um, as, as someone who I, I would I would assume spends a lot of your time alone in your office. Are there any things that you do to maintain community and to, um, you know, to to make sure that you're sure. staying connected to humans? <laughs> you know, um, what does community mean to you? Well, for me, it's uh, you know I, I have this sort of built-in version of, of uh, storycraft in in a critique group that I belong to. Nice. I, it's it's this it's twelve of us. Uh, they I've been with the same group now for going on thirty years. Wow. Uh, they I was with the same group before I was ever published. Uh, they, they you know they've seen my early short fiction that's now buried in my backyard, never to see the light of day. Uh, they've seen my rudimentary you know steps from when trying to craft short stories to working on my first novel. And they're the ones that, uh, you know, are right now critiquing you know, Cradle of Ice, the second book in the fantasy novel. So we meet uh, twice a month. And initially it was at, at, a, at a restaurant. Uh, now, of course, it's via Zoom, uh, though hopefully we'll eventually get back to going to restaurants again. So we have more, you know, FaceTime. Yeah. But, you know, we share chapters. We critique each other's work. We chat about life in general. We talk about writing in general. Uh, it's a mixture of published and unpublished authors. Um, uh, we have somebody as young as 12 working in the group now uh, that we have somebody in their 80s that's working on a story. So uh, they come from all different uh, aspects of life. So it's, it's, it's nice getting you know, 12 first eyes on my work. Uh, yeah. They're great for getting different inputs. You know, find it. They challenge me. You know, as much as I expect them to bow down when I walk into the room, they don't. They know me from the beginning, so they're right. very honest with their critiques, and they will. They will hold my feet to the fire. They will, you know, point when I'm, you know, maybe, you know, trying to slide something past that needs you know, a little bit more work. Um, so it's good to have that sense of community. That because uh, writing is a solitary, solitary job. You know, it's yeah. it's uh, you know try to physically do as much as I can. You know, whether it's walking the dogs, whether it's kayaking, whether it's you know hiking somewhere. Uh, occasionally still doing some caving uh uh so uh, you know try to physically keep myself you know active and that's in that it's involved a community that's not necessarily focused on literary you know pursuits but is a way of sort of disconnecting and keeping my my sense of isolation limited i love that um i i have a question that i've been asking people a lot lately and i'd, I'd love to get your take on this um what is a piece of writing advice uh good or bad or, or maybe you have one of each, who, who knows, that has stuck with you um, throughout your writing career. Maybe it was something that that opened your eyes and, and you know, unlocked a, a lock for you. Or maybe it's just a horrible piece of advice that you look <laughs> back and go, oh, man, I'm glad I didn't take that. Or I did take it and, you know, now I'm, you know, having to shovel my way out of it. Okay, I'll tell you a couple things. Uh, okay. First, the, the good the good advice, and this is what something I, I still adhere to today, is that and when I was, again, I, I had no formal training in writing. If you read any of my books, he'll, he'll go, he's had no formal training in writing. Um, it was all learned by reading. You know, I yeah. was an avid reader, and I thought, you know, I think if everybody's an avid reader, eventually think, oh, it would be really cool to walk into a bookstore one day and see my book on the shelf. Yeah. Um, so there's that, you know, that hidden, you know, sort of voice in the back of your head that's whispering give it a try give it a try um so i had to sort of self teach myself the the whole craft of writing the publishing world how to get things published where how do you approach an agent how to write a query letter etc cetera, etc cetera. But one of the adv advice is this is the 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 uh you've heard this probably a thousand times that you you need to write every day yeah they need to you need to practice your craft you should expect to write a million words before you should expect to be published you know you have to hone that skill and it's it's just not going to you're not going to sit down uh without ever written a word before and write you know the great american novel it's going to take some practice but i'll add my own personal caveat to that that i've learned from experiences not only should be should you be writing every day you should be reading every night is that again i mentioned before if you want to write in a certain genre you need to know that genre well so you need to yeah. read deeply in that genre also when you're struggling with learning how to write uh when you're struggling with your your 
your day of writing and you're thinking, gosh, I'm, this dialogue feels stale or, you know, how do I describe this character without looking in a mirror? Um, so that forms a little knot in your head during mm -hmm. your writing day. And as you read at night and you see how an author has tackled that subject or how oh, that's that's cool how he described that character. That's cool what he's doing with dialogue. So then it begins to untie that knot in your head mm -hmm. and your writing is going to become incrementally better. So if you're writing every day and reading every night, your prose is just going to naturally get stronger. Right. Fantastic. And today I still do I still do that. I mean, I have a notebook by my bed uh, that whenever I'm reading at night, uh, if an author does something I've never seen an author do before, they use something really unique or there's a turn of phrase or I jot it down. You know, even today, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'll see an author do something that I'm going to try to incorporate that in my next novel. So even though I'm now writing my 40th novel I and mean, I'm still reading every night looking for ways to, to you know, tweak my own writing better. So, you know, if I can do it after publishing 40 novels, you know, if you're a beginning writer, really encourage you, you still need to keep reading. You know, I've heard Absolutely. authors say, gosh, you know, I don't have time to read anymore. I don't get them. Uh, to me, it just seems oh. mystifying that they're, you know, I love reading to begin with. That's why I'm writing. I, you know, if, if that, that stole my love of reading, uh, I would not write. Um, yeah. I love reading that much. You know, I just could, uh, I couldn't give that up for the sake of writing a novel. Uh, the other side of the spectrum, advice that I think is, uh, is wrong is Steve Barry, a uh, good friend of mine. Uh, I love Steve. Yeah, Steve's a great, great character. Hopefully I'm going to see him in October. Uh, and uh, he says you should never have an exclamation point in your book. <laughs> I don't agree with that. There are many yeah. exclamation points in my books. So we have a, an ongoing war about that. I love that. It's it, it's kind of like Stephen King's advice about adverbs, you, you know. Right. Yeah. That's uh, hard and fast rules are made to be broken. That's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. So James, what what are you working on now? You you mentioned the the second fantasy book in the series is coming out uh, next year. Yes, yeah, be out next year. It's okay. uh, called Cradle of Ice. Um, just saw the cover for it, and as I said, I usually have to just say, yeah, I love it. No, they give me various options. The cover for, for Cradle of Ice is beautiful. Uh, working with my right now with the uh, graphic artist who did the animal sketches that you see in uh in Starless crown is continuing yeah. with the the creatures in the second book so we're working with her on that nice. beautiful work so i'm really, really excited for people to see what she's done with this next book novel uh working on of course uh the uh next sigma novel which is uh deals with uh how to describe this it deals with uh the uh you know, you know, Aboriginal mythology, it deals with the colonial history of, of, of Australia, it deals with um, the uh, expansion of the Chinese military into space, and it's a great treasure hunt for a mysterious artifact that might prove that we are not alone in the universe. So that's coming up next in the Sigma. Can't wait. Can't wait. Um, when people are hearing this, you can run out and grab the new Sigma Force novel. Um, the new fantasy novel, Starless Crown, is out everywhere already. Um, go pick up Kingdom of Bones. Uh, you will not be disappointed, I promise. Uh, James, is, is your website the best place for people to kind of dig into all the great stuff you're doing? Yeah, I always consider my website to be the encyclopedia of James Rollins. You know, if you want to know all about the books or about tour dates and details about uh, there's a section if you're a writer, sort of a QA and a about writing questions there's in there, too. Uh, for just a day in, day out, what's going on with my life? You know, I'm on social media uh, probably too much. Uh, I could probably get another book written if social media was ever invented. Um, so, uh, again, uh, whether it's, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, I'm on all the different sites for the day to day life of james rollins and james rollins.com is the 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 site where they can connect with all those places right exactly thank you very much for mentioning that great that's helpful <laughs> well james has been so much fun chatting um let's do it again Thanks, next thank year you. all right we'll, we'll put a we'll put a note in the calendar